Hi, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You're listening to Living the Wildlife, discussing all things related to vertebrate pest control as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. This is the disclaimer for wildlife control consultant and pest geek podcast for Living the Wildlife podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Welcome to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. So it's an unusual start for me today because we're in the midst of part two of my interview with Mr. Dillingham of Avatrol. So this is a chemical company that provides a chemical frightening product for the management of pest birds. So if you've missed part one, go back and find part one. We've done the previous week. This is going to be part two and there's going to be a part three. So stay tuned. Thanks for visiting. What we also found is that the way guys were measuring um, was by would oftentimes be by um, by like the volume method. That's what we call it, rather yeah. than by the weight method. And so what they were doing is they were going like, and and, and you might you be well, you wouldn't be, but listeners might be shocked. You know, even at some of the size of the companies, where it'd be like, okay, you know, what mixture ratio did you use? I I used a, a whatever a one to forty or something, right? And it's like, okay, great. How did you measure it out? It's like, well, like I used one of those solo cups, and it was like, yeah, yeah. For every one one cup of, I'm like, hold on, are you telling me you did forty one solo cups and got them exactly right? And then you did that how many times? It's like, no, yeah. like no way, like. Yeah. The, that is not science. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that from your training, right? So just to give people a historical view, back in the day, uh, you know, uh, it, the ratio was one to five on the hot end. That's yep. one active kernel for yep. five untreated kernels yep. up to one to 29, which would have been the low end of the treatment, one to 29. Uh, Sheldon's telling us that their preferred blend is one to 40, which is almost another, almost double yeah. reduction, almost another hundred percent reduction of the active ingredient, which is uh, just amazing. Yeah. That's how, I mean, like, that's how, how powerful the, the, the effects of the active are, or I should say how effective the effects of the active are um, at getting birds to communicate. Like, and, and that's really how it was intended from the beginning. Um, I, I think what's been acceptable by the market is what's changed like over the years. Yeah. Um, you know, and so we we really came in and changed with it, but we did see the lack of training there. And then the other side of it, again, that easy blend um, uh, uh, product is really our answer to, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but it's our answer to the control aspect. You know, so if someone is concerned, you know, they've got a, a fleet of trucks or something like that, could be a large fleet or small, small fleet, um, and they're concerned about making sure that it's done right. This eliminates the concern. And, and what we found, particularly, especially with the large and medium sized brands, is that really assuaged a lot of the concern mm. uh, you know, that, that, that they had. It was like, oh, wow, okay, we can make sure that this is mixed correctly. I mean, honestly, in fact, it is genuinely like we have yet to have any incident happen. We rolled out Easy Blend, um, I think, four years ago now. We've yet to have a single um incident happen um with it's amazing with, yeah right and i would think that's just more the convenience factor for an own for a business owner saying look i don't have to worry about my guys you know making a mistake was that you know they, they shouldn't be using scoops but we know that they're probably going to be using scoops was that well did i put in five scoops or did i put in 10 scoop you lose count i i think the convenience factor now back in the day i have to go i have to go pre you know, kind of pre Sheldon or Mr. Dillingham here, the pre pre Sheldon again. That was at one to five to one to twenty nine. At the one oh, to twenty nine level, I I recall it was a four percent expected mortality for pigeons at the one to twenty five. You could have up to that, and I think it's less for house sparrows and more for yep. starlings. I always <laughs> screw that up. But yep. at one to forty, what is the ratio 
oh, let's say worst case scenario of what kind of mortality should you expect worst case scenario for pigeons at a one to 40. Yeah. I mean like one, one to 40, you're talking about like, honestly, probably less than 1% um, somewhere in there it, 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 as far as your, as far as your worst case goes. And I'm talking like, yeah, I mean, this this happened like recently. I mean, large apartment complex, like 500 or so pigeons. Wow. There, you know, um, and um, we're talking, I think we had four birds. I think it was four birds that actually. That's it. it. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 And the thing is, the thing is, too, that um, the thing is, too, that a lot of guys don't, don't recognize as well is that, you know, birds get sick like humans do as well too. Like birds can have weak hearts. Um, they can have, you know, weak immune systems, like all sorts of stuff. Oh, there are all sorts of diseases. You can look them up and, oh, and yeah. find it or the listeners can look them up and find them. Yeah. Um, and so if, if your fight or flight kicks in, I mean, you know, th think about a guy who, who hasn't run in like, you know, 30 years who has been sitting on his couch. You know what I mean? Like just, just tossing, tossing back beers every night. You know, that guy's probably going to have a heart attack if he goes right. to try and run all of a sudden. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And so that kind of stuff can, can also happen with, 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 with birds as well. Yeah. Um, and so but it's yeah. not the horror story where you'd have, you know, pigeons dive bombing in communities and the kids are screaming it's makes the newspaper and think about that 500 birds have been evicted off this roof let's say and only four mortalities were identified that's just yeah, yeah. that's uh that's amazing yeah i mean it's it's yeah. arguable um that you know i think we've, we've talked about this before but it's like i've seen birds die from every method used in bird control sure. uh, yep. like we, we have a proclivity in in western society right to or, or some do anyway to to demonize um chemical use right. uh, and right. it's one of those things where it's like no like it, we're, not everything is apples to apples don't get me wrong like there are definitely chemicals that you know are will will just blaze everything in sight uh right but Sure. Um, but honestly, there are a lot of things that fall even under the restricted use category where it's like, man, have you, uh, uh, I ask guys all the time, like, have you ever, have you pulled out like a, a, a gallon of bleach or whatever and read the, the label? Like that thing <laughs> should be restricted. Use. Yeah, it's, it is a pesticide, folks. <laughs> right. A lot of people, the people, the people who hate chemicals, don't, you know, yeah, like, right. yeah, I, I made a comment about that recently. So when you have these, so this particular product, so let's talk about what are the uh what are the like what's the ideal situation or it maybe maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it uh yeah. what are some of the classic maybe that's a better way to some of the yeah. classic situations where avitrol is a is like this is the tool that fits this situation like yeah. this is like you want to Absolutely. definitely consider that yeah. yes like you know, so as an overarching, we sell in about 17 core verticals, right? So there are a bunch of like classic things. But I, what okay. I can say is, can the birds leave, right? Like okay. is the question that you want to ask, right? Like are these birds absolutely trapped and they can't get out of here or can they actually leave? Um, you know, so, and, and I'm not saying that we haven't had, you know, situations where, you know, I, I won't name, name, name the place, but I mean, like right. we have we've done multiple hotels, um, on the strip, um, in, in Vegas mm -hmm. over the years. And, uh, you know, ha had one where huge, huge, huge hotel and sparrows were deep in the hotel. Um, you know, it's like, there's not like, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, the birds can't, you know, it's like, so we still use it now. You can, you can per the label, you can use it as, as you know, at, at a, at a pretty hot mix. Right. And right. you're, you know, um, you're causing mortality, but the, but the truth is, is that like, you're not going to go use a spare trap or whatever, or whatever, and, and catch those sparrows missing at them or whatever, and then go release them outside. Um, yeah, I mean, if no, you're, if you're reputable, you're, you're not going to, no, because, don't, don't because release, they will don't, find their way right back in the building. No, no second chances, folks. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, you know, so you're going to euthanize, euthanize those birds anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, a, it's just what method are you going to use to do it? Um, so that's really the question that, you know, that I encourage guys to ask is like, 
can birds um, actually leave? Yeah. Volume Okay. of birds doesn't doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, we um, we help teams sell, you know, for five and ten birds. Um, and we help teams. So I think the largest one that I'm aware of was a little over a million birds. Um, you know, yeah. And that's when you're starting to get into, um, you know, big uh, uh, feed yard and like dairy outfits and stuff like that. How many, uh, let me just interrupt you here, a, mil a million birds, how many bait trays would you possibly need for, th for that? I'm just trying to think about how, Yeah. like, you, you, do you bring in a, an 18 wheeler flatbed truck with full of bait Yeah. trays? <laughs> yeah, Cause, uh, you know, I, yeah, so when it when it starts to get into those applications, oh my gosh. because it's so wide open, and oftentimes these farms are like the only like real food source for flocks Right. that size, Yeah. especially if they're migrating, um, you know, for miles and miles around. Um, the treatment's different than what you would get into with your your standard sort of commercial treatment. Um, Oh, okay. So All right. in which case, we might be talking about you know troughs that are inaccessible for um, you know for for livestock and like all that kind of stuff. You know, Okay. kind of changing that feeding pattern basically. Um, but those are the situations where you'll look at those troughs, you'll look at those alleys, and you can't see the ground. Like you can't see the trough. It's just black flapping wings. It looks like asphalt or something, you Yeah, know, right, at, right. at a distance. All right. But uh, but yeah, it, it is effective on on flocks of all sizes. But the key is, is that whether whoever, whoever the wildlife control company or pest control company is, say yes, because your company will give them the proper support. If they reach out to you, you will, you know, hold them by the hand. These are my words. You'll hold them by the hand, walk them through the process. And it's like, yes, we can do this. Help them with the bidding. And, but stop saying no, folks. Start saying yes. Is what Yes. is what you're saying? Yeah. In fact, like um, we we have a full certification training as well, which we even made it we made it easier this year for you um, for if anybody's listening and thinking about it. Um, and, and we released a master class, um, and that is a pre-recorded uh, class. Now you know it's got over four hours of content in it, um, so you know the breaks and all that stuff aren't in there. Uh, And um, you can you can just digest that like as as you go. What's great is like there are CEUs like attached to that as well too. So if you're looking for CEUs or refresh there, um, you've got that also. And what's what's cool too about that is from a CEU standpoint, because we are both invertebrate wildlife um, and we we fall under uh, pesticide. You actually, a lot of times guys can get, if the state offers it, they can actually get sort of these dual credits, both in Right. vertebrate wildlife, if they need those CEUs, in Yeah. addition to, um, you know, in, in addition to some of the more standard stuff that they might deal with with pesticides. Um, but that that's, that's available as well, uh, too. Uh, the other thing that I'll say is we also offer um, free, like, 30 minute to hour long, you know, uh, digital sessions. Like if they, you know, cause guys will do stuff at the beginning of the week with their teams or into the week with their teams. Oh. And, and we come in and we offer, you know, all of that for free, uh, 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 that, that particular type of training for free so that guys can, guys can become edu educated that way. So you, so your company, a representative of your company will zoom in and do a little, a little Okay. avatrol training session for that particular company for that particular day, which okay. Yeah, uh, both. And that's both. Honestly, like, really, it's every topic that you could you could think of. One of the things I have kind of found and I know, you know, obviously, most of the time when we talk about training, we end up being on the op side. Uh, one of the things I found kind of on the on the in, in, in pests and in wildlife sales training is very um very underutilized um, it, particularly starting to get into you know getting into topics like you know closing like what does a closing process actually look like um how do you actually close from the beginning of a sale to the end of the sale to ensure that it actually goes through is there a process a repeatable process to to that um and so we actually get in we actually offer both sales full sales training on every part of the process from proposing to closing to the in-between Um, in addition to like templates that are proven to help close jobs and all sort of like, I mean, email templates. And, and again, 
everything about it is a system. Um, you know, really what we did is we took it and we said, okay, how can we create a system where a guy can go from zero, I'm not really doing any bird, to I can create a repeatable process where it's like I'm delivering like predictable results, but I'm also delivering predictable sales year over year over year. Um, and so that's that's really what we offer there. The uh, what uh, can you ha do you have the ability or does your company have the ability to work with uh, companies that are not licensed, but they have the lead of the client? Do that? Can someone sort of hand that job off to you or, or is there a way that they can get their get a little bit of piece of the action? Uh, do you yeah. have a team that comes in? Explain that process for those who, yeah. who say, you know, I'm not going to I have I talked to some people. They're like. We're never pesticiding, but they might be open to having someone else as a, either a sub contractor yeah. or whatever the case yeah. may be. Absolutely. So there's actually a couple. I mean, thank you for asking that question because uh, mm -hmm. I, I didn't I wouldn't have thought about it. Sure. Um, but there are a couple of things that could be in, in just insanely great, I think, for uh, for operators, even if they don't want to do some of the applications. So one of the arms of our business that we offer is called direct to business. Um, and so we, what we, one of the things we used to do is we used to hand off leads and stuff like that or whatever. And one of, one of the problems that we would run into was that, you know, we would hand leads off and we were like, man, these close rates are lower than we would like them to be. Most of the time that was because we didn't actually have our hand like inside the process. And, um, the timing was the timing wasn't quite right. Like we'd be back in touch with the operator, but their follow up process maybe wasn't super strong. One of the things yeah. to remember in bird that a lot of guys may not be aware of. Um, this is actually true in, in wildlife too. The pricing is different um, than what guys are are used to um, on you know what most commercial companies are used to on the pest side, yeah. um, and the process is different too. Like. You know, most people, when they see like a, a, a rat or a mouse or something like that, like they're just going like, uh, like to be honest in this, I don't want to insult anybody, but didn't take a whole lot of sales acumen to sell a rat. <laughs> um, you have a motivated it, client. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> same thing with roaches, right? Like all, yeah. all, all the above. It's like, I don't, I don't care. Like yeah. get it here, right? Um, but when it comes to, when it comes to birds and some of this, uh, some of the other wildlife, um, a lot of times these guys are thinking about it from an aesthetic standpoint, you know, or, or something like that. And uh, when they see the price, they're like, well, no, like that, that, that <clears throat> value ratio is off. Yeah. All right. So that requires an actual closing process. Um, you know, so the closing process that we've got in place is actually one that, that is modeled after high ticket sales. That's what it's modeled after. Mm. And it's one that is really guided and guides the customer to a close with the closing statements and other things at the very, very beginning. Um, but I want to circle back to make sure that I answer your initial question yeah. here, which is like, what can they do? So the direct to business arm of what we do is us where we are actually selling. Like, I mean, we go all the way through. We close the client. Um, they we actually we are the contract holder. And then we will hand um, we hand those jobs off to certified service providers. And we do this all over the country. Um some of the biggest brands like uh, that need help uh, we have and work with and are in their service channel, um, which actually can be a great way for smaller operators to get in with some of these national brands, like if they're not currently in service channel. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other uh, the other thing is if somebody has something and they're like, man, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get into it. First of all, they can send it. You can send that to us or, the, or at least link up to it, link up with us and we can at uh, support at avatrol.com. Uh, so, support at avatrol.com? Yeah, support at avatrol.com. They can yeah. send that to us and we'll get back okay. to talk through the details. Um, but here's a couple of opportunities here too that I think the listeners hopefully will like. I would imagine that probably most of the audience probably gets into trapping, um, you know, it, 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 oh, yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And usually with trapping, um, what's required is some type of baiting, like getting, right. getting the, the animal into the trap. That's right. All right. Yep. So they're already familiar with what we would call pre baiting, um, on our side. Um, so if someone reaches out to us and they want to, they, act, uh, you know, and they, they want to take the job on, but they don't want to deal with the hassle of doing doing the active side. 
we can actually go through and close it. And there are two phases to the treatment. There's your prebate phase and then your activate phase. Right. We would happily contract with any of the any of the guys, you know, they're that they're that listening for them to actually execute the prebate phase of treatment if they wanted to. Wow. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that already fits inside of their wheelhouse um, because they're already used to prebate. Now we, we would provide all the materials. That's a great thing about our direct to business arm is like, we don't charge back materials or anything like that. We carry all of it. And it's basically like free jobs for our, our certified service providers. Mm. Um, so they could do the prebating and then, um, and then of course we could actually navigate the contract uh, 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 with someone for the, another certified service provider for the active baiting. That's no big deal um, at all. Um, the second thing in this is um, really, really lucrative. Um, I think anyway, um, is that um, one of the other things that we offer is what we call a protection program, what would traditionally be known as a monitoring program. Um, and, um, this applies, um, both, uh, proactively, um, and, um, reactively. So reactively would be, I have a bird issue. Okay, great. We helped you get your bird issue out of there. Our team is always going to work to sell a protection program on the backside of it. If it's our contract, we recommend that to, to everyone listening to that you do that. And basically all that it consists of is it's just untreated grain, like so many trays. Like if you had 10 trays out there, you reduce them down to about 25% of those trays. Um, and, you know, half a cup of untreated grain goes in there and that gets checked once a month for signs of activity. And that's it. And you might be charging 150, 250, 300, 500 dollars a month or whatever. Uh, right. For for that service. Now, if they do remember bird infestations start small and they get larger over time. And so, you know, you might have done a clean out that was, let's say, 500 pigeons, like I talked about earlier. Um, but it's not going to go from like 500 pigeons to all of a sudden new flocks move in and you've got hundreds overnight. It's going to start with a couple of birds first. Well, that monitoring program allows you to catch those problems before they turn into you know big issues. Um, again, this is that reactively part after the initial. But I'm going to blow the doors wide off right off of this here in a second. Um so on the backside of existing jobs, solid protection program, that team could then, if they handed us that lead, they could actually be the ones that implement that protection program. Neither the, the pre-baiting phase nor the protection program phase actually require any kind of licensing at all. Right. Um, you know, so it's like you're really just working with untreated grain and trays, basically, and you're refilling them. And you've got an op sheet and you've got a con an ops contact where we're, in fact, we provide a check in form and all this other kind of stuff or whatever. We ask you all the key questions like on every site visit uh, that you should be asking anyway, um, like all that kind of stuff. We monitor. And then, like, of course, if anything is amiss, you know, of course, our, our, uh, our support team on the ops side is actually in touch to talk about that. Any fear about by leaving, uh, you know, it's clearly you're talking about a very small amount of food out there, but is there any fear that that's, that's going to be an attractant to, uh, you know, the bird flying overhead that's, that wasn't part of the previous flock or something uh, discuss that. Yeah, you know, that, and that's a, that's a common question. And, and you're right. Like you actually hit on that answer, um, and that the amount of grain that's going in that tray is so, so small that it's not, and so infrequent that it's not enough to create a whole brand new infestation. It generally is going to be birds that were, they're going to end up there anyway, uh, right? Because again, food, water, harborage, you know, some combination of that still exists at the site and that makes that site still attractive. Uh, right, to, right. To, to other birds so it's like they're gonna they're they would they wouldn't want to show up anyway so it allows you to catch it while it's small and the thing is is as that um as time goes on um if there are birds that show up because they're already paying their monthly you know you're not charging them extra to come in and do your rotation but you're really only talking about one or two maybe rotations instead of like and you don't have to do your prebate phase because the birds already prebated all that kind of stuff right so you end up making money on the other side now, here's the doors blowing the doors off. I said I was going to, and this is it. And the guys that have caught this, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, those protection programs can also be sold proactively. So if you have a location 
that doesn't have a problem with birds, but you're already in there doing the work or whatever, right? Maybe it's a chain that you're doing the work for and you know, you're dealing with other problems that they have. You can actually roll into your package a protection program for birds at those existing locations. So one of the things that we train teams on is like if they sell a, you know, um, sell a package to let's say a large home improvement store that's a national chain or something like that. Yeah. Um, it, where they have to get rid of birds. Well, every single location is now eligible, whether or not they have an existing bird issue or not, for some type of program. This is not a foreign concept to, to the industry. It's already happening at a corporate level with things like rats uh, and mice and ants uh, and different things like that, You know, where someone's working with a co commercial account manager um, and doing it that way. Um, so think about it now. Uh, I would encourage listeners to think about it now where it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Every location that I drive by now is actually a potential bird opportunity. It's not just ones that I can see birds at. Mm. Wow. That's quite a, that, that's quite a, just try to get my, I'm not much, I'm not a very good salesperson. So I'm <laughs> trying to wrap my, <laughs> wrap my head around that. This is why I'm not, which is why I'm not necessarily in sales. I think if I was getting into sales, I'd be inside sales rather than right, outside yeah. sales. Right. So I could handle the calls coming in, but uh, right, out there yeah. beating the drum. I don't have the personality. A man's got to know his limitations. Right, uh, I'd yeah. like to switch, uh, switch up here yeah. uh, and talk about those of us in more, uh, you know, rural environment. I, I'm, I'm based in Montana as some as people may know. Um, so one of my, cons one of my sad points in my life i mean not, not that it's a huge sadness but i was i i was it was sad that we lost uh starla side complete uh, -huh. uh and i know that's different you know it's not your company but it's the uh, starla side complete with drc 1339 now only wildlife services has access to 1339 um i I know that Avatrol is not primarily a, a means, it's a chemical frightening device. I just want to kind of put a a word in for for those of us in more rural settings to keep that one to five ratio when the goal is not to frighten but to whack. Um <laughs> even though you know, even though it won't kill the whole flock like DRC 1339, is there uh I just want to say that there is a place for that because not everywhere. Sometimes what gets me upset about the, uh, you know, the pest control industry, everything is so urban driven and, and it makes perfect sense. That's where the money is. That's where the people are. I totally get it. But there are portions of the country that are in rural areas and, it, and it's, you know, this farm or this feedlot, maybe 10 miles away from a city center. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if, if, and they don't care if they're dive bombing birds because that's what they, because right now they're dive bombing, but they also lift off and fly away again and uh -huh. they want them not to lift off again. Is uh -huh. there uh, any, uh, any way to have even something even hotter than one to five, or you think that's going to be a bridge too far for the EPA or for your company? Is that yeah. A I, I think that that pro probably I think in the environment that we're in, um, like, honestly, I, I feel like, you know, this part of the discussion really um, veers more into like societal norm and, you know, and, and, and what has developed to become social mores. Yeah, um, you're right. You're right. You know, than yeah. it is than it is, you know, actual pure science. I mean, the, the, right. the, the truth is um, the truth is, is there are so many of these. So, so many pests, and it's not just birds, there's so many pests uh, where the volume of predators to, you know, to, to, to the volume of population is skewed in one direction or the other, mm. uh, per, particularly usually in the direction of the prey. Yeah, um, right. And because of, uh, because of societal norms and the way that they are sort of now, um, even though we might say that, oh yeah, hey, like you know, you get the same guy that 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 says, hey, science matters to me. It's yep. the same guy that will very much ignore the science. Oh um, yes, I, when, when heartstrings are involved, absolutely. <laughs> so the uh, when it comes to 
let's talk about secondary poisoning because that's obviously whenever we're talking about chemicals, people are concerned about, well, what happens if, you know, for that four pigeons out of the 500, if, if my dog ate those four pigeons, which would be, you know, hard to imagine, but you know, there's people probably ask these questions. Will my dog get harmed or will my cat get harmed if they eat one of those pigeons that uh, suffered mortality from Avatrol? Could you address some of that for our audience? Yes, that's a great question. Um, oh, although I, I wonder if, if I could wrap oh, no, go. By on all that, means. On yeah. that very, the very last point there, yep. um, just talking about like rule rule and treatments and all of that kind of stuff. Yep. I mean, yep. again, I, we recommend using discretion, of course, you know, we, we reckon we uh, recognize our role as chemical uh, uh, producers as mm -hmm. being, you know, good stewards. Like that's really what we want to work towards is doing yeah. that, being great environmental stewards and training people to be great environmental stewards. And so, you know, you, you use discretion as you, as you navigate. I mean, the label gives leeway for, um, for lots of, of different, different situations. Um, you know, at, uh, you know, as we know that like, if, it, it, generally speaking, like if you're working with us, like the template that you're going to be provided is a one to one to 40, uh, uh, template. Um, you know, again, we set that goal on reduction of, of the amount of active, um, that, that being sold. And, and we have, uh, we, we've achieved that, um, I think, uh, I do think, however, like, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife probably, has some things to figure out um, in terms of overall population control and the methods in which we as a country want to walk. Well, we've reached the end of part two of my marathon interview with Mr. Dillingham, owner of Avatrol Corporation, which is a chemical bird frightening device. Uh, frightening product, I should say, for the management of pest birds. I hope you enjoyed it. We still have one more edition to go for this marathon interview. We're really grateful for Mr. Dillingham uh, coming on to the show. If you are interested in being on the show, definitely reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. No, it doesn't cost you anything. We'll be glad to have you. We're trying to get information out to the public because Living the Wildlife podcast is all about getting technical research-based or highly experience-based research on wildlife damage management out to the public and to the professional community. If you have comments, thoughts, we'd love to hear from you. Again, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. And you've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Stay tuned. Part three is coming. Take care.